A warm welcome um, to everybody um, to our event today, um, and particularly to the members of our um, fantastic panel. Um, my name is Anne Fordham. I'm the Executive Director of the International Drug Policy Consortium, and I'll be moderating this event today. Um, and I'd like to start firstly by thanking our co-sponsors, the Geneva Missions of Albania, France, Greece, Paraguay, Portugal, Switzerland, and Uruguay, as well as the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Center for Legal and Social Studies, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, Harm Reduction International, Penal Reform International, and the International Center for Human Rights and Drug Policy at the University of Essex. I also wanted to remind you of a few housekeeping rules, although by now I'm sure many of you are experts on Zoom. So we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A function in the menu at the bottom of the screen. And that's the best way for us to capture your questions and refer them to the panelists. You can also use the normal chat function to share your thoughts, reactions, or any interesting um, links to documents or resources that you might want to share with other participants. Um, but please don't ask questions in the chat um, because we may miss them. So please use the Q&A function for that. We are running this event in both English and Spanish. Um, if you click on the interpretation button in the menu, you'll be able to select your language of choice. Um, if you're hearing both languages at the same time, that means you need to mute um, the feed called original language. So I'll just, um, by way of introduction, um, I have a few opening remarks. Um, this year, we unfortunately mark 50 years since US President Richard Nixon officially escalated a punitive, repressive, and militarized response to drugs across the globe. He declared drugs public enemy number one. Although stigmatizing narratives around drugs did not start with Nixon, from that moment, they fled anew, enabled by political and diplomatic pressure and reinforced by funding for dr draconian measures. Decades of these brutal policies that have sought to achieve a drug-free world have brought nothing short of a global human rights catastrophe. The consequences include mass incarceration of millions, thousands of extrajudicial killings, the denial of the rights of indigenous people, the denial of evidence-based harm reduction programs for millions, and uncounted acts of police brutality, violence, and racism. In many countries, the dehumanizing power of drug laws has been used to target oppressed groups, women, black people, indigenous people, other people of color, people living in poverty, LGBTQI plus people, amongst many others. To this end, we welcome the report of the High Commissioner on promotion and protection of the human rights and fundamental freedoms of Africans and people of African descent against excessive use of force and other human rights violations by law enforcement officers. Our discussion today though folks focus on our, focuses on arbitrary detention and the discussion is so crucial. For 60 years, the international human rights and drug control systems developed in almost complete isolation from each other. Human rights were scarcely referenced or taken into consideration by the UN drug control bodies. And at the same time, the Human Rights Council did not acknowledge or discuss drug policies and their devastating impact on human rights. However, in recent years, the entire human rights system from the Human Rights Council to the treaty body bodies have started to reckon with the human rights devastation brought about by the global drug war. In no small part, thanks to the determination and commitment by many of the people who are joining us today in this virtual room. The very important study that we'll be discussing today on arbitrary detention and drug policies should be seen as the latest and one of the most powerful steps in this direction with its in-depth analysis and robust recommendations. Starting with the chair rapporteur of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, the experts we have brought together in this panel will give us a perspective of the broad range of topics covered in this report and will help us discuss how we can make sure its recommendations are well disseminated, well known and implemented. 
they will touch on extremely urgent topics, such as the criminalization of people who use drugs, the prevalence of compulsory treatment in public and private centers, mass incarceration, and let's not forget, as we speak, the impact of punitive and disproportionate drug laws on women and the militarization of drug enforcement, amongst many other topics. For my part, I would like to highlight two recommendations that are highly relevant in this UN setting. Firstly, the strong recommendation to take into account the UN system common position on drugs and the international guidelines on human rights and drug policy in the formulation of drug policies and human rights. And secondly, the equally strong recommendation to monitor the provision of financial and technical assistance to other countries so that this does not contribute to human rights violations in drug enforcement operations and to reduce or cease assistance as appropriate. In summary, this is a study that will need to be, be read, discussed and implemented at national, regional and international level, not only in Geneva, but in all corners of the UN system. The Human Rights Council will need to assume a leading role in this process, and this will be done, for instance, by ensuring that its findings and recommendations are included in the next Human Rights Council resolution on arbitrary detention or by adopting a new resolution on drugs to follow up to the resolutions of 2015 and 2018. But we'll discuss that more later. So without further ado, let's start this discussion with the opening remarks of His Excellency Ambassador Norman, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Switzerland to the United Nations and other organizations in Geneva, and Special Representative of Switzerland to the Human Rights Council. Ambassador Bauman, you have the virtual floor. Dear Mrs. Fordham, dear Anne, thank you so much. Excellencies, dear participants, dear colleagues, uh, uh, good, good day. And it's really a pleasure and, and an honor for me to be with you and to say a, a, few, a few short words at the beginning of uh, this particularly relevant slide uh, event. And when I say uh, this event is particularly relevant, I'm saying this for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because the event is, is very timely, as you may know, Switzerland, together with uh, partner states presented the first, um, uh, the very first resolution of human rights and drug policy to the Human Rights Council in 2015. Uh, and this uh, groundbreaking development was, was then followed by another successful uh, resolution three years later in 2018. Uh, since then, the, the interlinkages between drug policy uh, on the one hand and human rights on the other uh, have received increasing attention and recognition. And one uh, great example uh, thereof, which was already mentioned, is, is of course the international guidelines on, on human rights and drug policy. These guidelines developed with the financial support of UNDP, uh, Germany, and, and my own country highlight the measures states should undertake or refrain from undertaking in, in order to comply with their uh, human rights obligations and commitments. Uh, and Switzerland will continue to fully support the dissemination and implement, implementation of this, this very useful tool. Close attention to the links between uh, drug policies and human rights is important. However, challenges uh, persist and human rights, uh, human rights lens uh, should be applied systematically in relation to drug policies. For example, as we have seen again during this pandemic, um, one, one area where huge challenges uh, remain is the area of arbitrary detention. We are therefore here today to, to take a closer look at, the, at this, this new study on arbitrary detention relating to drug policies. You will hear from, from our distinguished panelists why uh, drug use is not a sufficient cause for inca incarceration and why states uh, should urgently close compulsory drug uh, detention centers. And secondly, I, 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 again, I call this a particularly uh, relevant uh, event today because uh, the topic we discuss is, is, is cross-regional. It is a concern for, for many uh, different states around the world, and it is a global uh, concern. Consequently, we encourage uh, OHCHR, UNODC, and the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention to disseminate the study amongst relevant international, regional, and national um, organizations and bodies. And all member states are, are encouraged to take the findings of the study into consideration and to develop drug policies that comply with international uh, human rights law and that align with relevant international standards, such as the international guidelines on uh, human rights and drug policy that, 
the ones I mentioned before. Um, the the cross-regional relevance of today's topic is also evidenced by, by the broad range of, of co-sponsors and the very diverse composition of the panel today uh, with people uh, really from, from very different um, backgrounds and continents. Uh, so, Excellencies, dear colleagues, let me, let me end by expressing my, my gratitude to the International Drug Policy Consortium that really deserves all the, all the credit for, uh, for putting this event together today. And uh, also, as, as ended just before, let me, let me my turn uh, also thank uh, the, the, the co-sponsors once again, Albania, France, Greece, Paraguay, Portugal, Uruguay, uh, then the OHCHR, the Center for Legal and Social Studies, Harm Reduction International, the International Center on Human Rights and Drug uh, Policy of the University of Essex, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs and Panel Reform International. And of course, a big thanks, uh, uh, last but, but, but very from, far from least, to our distinguished panelists who will now uh, take over and, and walk us through uh, some of the, of the crucial aspects of human rights, drug policies and arbitrary detention. So thank you so much, uh, uh, dear participants. Thank you especially for, uh, to all of you for attending this, uh, this side event. And I wish you um, a fruitful meeting. So, and I uh, hand you over the, the floor back again. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you so much for being with us today, for your kind words. And also, you know, thank you to Switzerland for your continued um, and sustained um, leadership um, at this important nexus of um, human rights and, and drug policy. Um, so we'll move on to our first panelist, uh, whom we are deeply grateful to have with us today, knowing that she has a very busy schedule. Um, Dr. Elena Steinhardt is the Chair Rapporteur of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, um, and she'll present the main recommendations of the report here for us today. Um, but she's also presenting what is today at the Human Rights Council, um, this study, and um, the interactive dialogue that will begin after our session today, so she'll have to leave us um, a little early. Um, Dr. Steiner, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, Excellencies, colleagues from the UN agencies, civil society, distinguished participants. On behalf of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, I thank the organizers of this special event for extending invitation to the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention to introduce its latest study on arbitrary detention relating to drug policies prepared by the group at the request of the Council. From the outset and on behalf of the group, I would like to extend my sincerest appreciation to all stakeholders for their contributions prepared and provided to the group during the trying period of the global pandemic. Overall, 21 states, six national human rights institutions and 27 civil society organizations sent their written submissions. This was followed by consultations with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and the International Narcotics Control Board, as well as a virtual expert consultation. This study follows previous concerns raised by the working group in its numerous reports to the Human Rights Council about the increasing and in some cases systematic instances of arbitrary detention as a consequence of drug control laws and policies worldwide. The working group has also previously expressed concern about the frequent use of various forms of administrative detention imposed to control people who use drugs, often framed as health interventions, which may lead to involuntary commitment or compulsory drug treatment, in turn leading to arbitrary deprivation of liberty. Through this study, we therefore hope to provide further guidance to states on practical measures to prohibit and indeed prevent arbitrary arrest and detention in the context of drug policy. Madam Chair, let me now highlight some of the main findings and recommendations of the study. The working group notes the punitive drug control laws and policies continue to be used in many states, despite being ineffective in reducing drug trafficking or addressing non-medical drug use and supply. Such policies have resulted in the increasing use of arbitrary detention in the context of drug control with people who use drugs being particularly at risk of arbitrary detention. The so-called war on drugs has resulted in further increase in detention and imprisonment for drug-related offenses. 
disproportionate actions by some states to apply criminalization provisions of drug control treaties or to incorporate these in their domestic legislations have frequently resulted in widespread human rights violations, leading to increased arbitrary detention. Evidence shows that the so-called war on drugs has failed to address the drug problem. Abusive, repressive, and disproportionate drug control policies and laws are counterproductive, whilst also violating human rights, undercutting public health, and wasting public resources. In this study, the working group identified several human rights violations in the so-called war on drugs context, such as interrogating suspects under the influence of drugs and subjecting persons to testing without their consent or without judicial warrant, the overuse of and prolonged pretrial detention lasting in some instances for months and even years, and psych uh, psychological as well as physical violence towards detainees, including inter alia the withholding of substitution therapy from drug dependent suspects. Another serious concern is they identified wide range of violations of fair trial standards for persons accused of drug related crimes. Furthermore, disproportionate sentences for drug related offenses often accompanied by the ban on parole or amnesty for those convicted of drug related offenses in some jurisdictions contribute to prison overcrowding and call into question the compliance with international standards requiring respect for the dignity of persons deprived of their liberty. The working group also notes that the imposition of the death penalty for drug related offences and the misuse of drug control to silence human rights defenders, journalists and political opponents is incompatible with international standards. Furthermore, we also recall that if the legislation under which detention took place did not meet international standards, detention in pursuit of such legislation is also arbitrary. In the light of these findings, the working group rep recommends that states decriminalize the use and possession of drugs for personal use, including the possession of associated paraphernalia and release persons detained only for drug use or possession for personal use, review their convictions and expunge their records. The states are also encouraged to review procedures relating to detention, arrest, search, testing, pretrial detention, trial and sentencing in order to address situations enabling arbitrary detention and other human rights violations. Abolishing the mandatory pretrial detention and mandatory sentences for those convicted of minor drug related offences to ensure alternatives to incarceration and ensuring proportionate sentencing for drug related offences through amending relevant legislation and sentencing guidelines also figure prominently among the recommendations. The working group has also observed that criminalization of drug use facilitates the deployment of the criminal justice system against drug users in a discriminatory way with law enforcement agencies often targeting members of vulnerable and marginalized groups, such as minorities, people of African descent, indigenous people, women, persons with disabilities, persons with AIDS, and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex persons, homeless persons, sex workers, migrants, juveniles, the unemployed and ex-convicts may also be thus vulnerable. The working group therefore recommends that states address how the justice process approaches specific groups that may be the object of discrimination in order to stop their targeting and the disproportionate drug control enforcement efforts. States are also encouraged to protect the rights of indigenous people to produce crops and plants that they have traditionally grown for their religious, medicinal and customary purposes and ensure that such production is not criminalized. I would also like to highlight findings and recommendations concerning healthcare for drug users in detention. The study has revealed the insufficient availability of harm reduction services and drug treatment for drug dependent persons in detention. Only 56 states provide opioid substitution therapy in prisons and when provided, it may be available only to limited percentage of inmates. The working group also found that despite the evidence in terms of the lack of effectiveness of compulsory treatment, the practice of confining people who use or who are suspected of using drugs against their will in state-run or private compulsory drug treatment centers is still widespread and can give rise to arbitrary detention. Similarly, courts often coerce defendants with a choice between imprisonment and drug treatment. 
the working group considers that emphasis should be placed on harm reduction whilst addressing the social and economic vulnerabilities and follow-up. Specifically trained healthcare professionals and appropriately trained social care professionals should be solely responsible for the treatment of and care for people who use drugs. In the view of the working group, the shift from punitive to supportive approach should be translated into making drug treatment voluntary and based on informed consent. All compulsory drug detention and treatment centers should therefore be closed and further admissions stopped. Instead, voluntary, evidence-informed and rights-based health and social services should be made available in the community. Madam Chair, the working group will now turn its attention to disseminating the study among the widest possible range of stakeholders and invite initiatives in supporting such further dissemination and implementation of its recommendations. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Steinert, for this excellent presentation and again to the working group for your important work here and your very clear and robust recommendations. Um, I'm, because we know that you'll be, I have, have to leave us early today, I'm just going to um, ask you one question uh, now because I don't think you'll still be here for the Q&A. Um, so with this study, the working group has given us one of the most powerful sets of drug policy recommendations to align drug laws with international human rights law. But the study also underscores the immense distance between human rights standards and the daily experience of people who use drugs and other affected communities. Um, the question is, how are you looking at cooperating with international and national institutions to ensure that they understand and are working to implement the recommendations in your report? Thank you very much. Um, I shall be pleased to share the few, first few initial steps the working group intends to take to further disseminate the study and further the implementation of the recommendations that we are making in the study. Firstly, as required by the Human Rights Council, the report will be shared with the Commission on Narcotic Drugs as the policy making body of the United Nations with the prime responsibility for drug control matters. The working group also hopes to be able to present this study to the Commission at its reconvened 64th session to be held on 9th and 10th of December of the current year. Moreover, <clears throat> the working group intends to share the report, the study, with the International Narcotics Control Board and to initiate a discussion on how to promote the implementation of the recommendations through the work of the board members. The working group considers that this independent quasi-judicial monitoring body for the implementation of the United Nations International Drug Control Conventions could play a key role in furthering the study and the recommendations made, including inter alia, through regular consultations with governments as well as its country missions arranged in agreement with the concerned governments. The working group also plans to share the study with a wide range of regional partners, including the Horizontal Working Party on Drugs, the coordinating body responsible for leading and managing the European Union Council's work on drugs, the Asian Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights and the Latin American Commission on Drugs and Democracy, just to name a few. Moreover, the working group will streamline the recommendations in its own work through, for example, our official country visits to states where the drug policy debate is per pertinent. In this context, the working group will encourage states to implement the relevant recommendations contained in the study. However, the, in concluding, the working group stands ready to work with all the stakeholders, including the civil society, in further disseminating the report and the recommendations. Within its mandate, the working group in arbitrary detention welcomes all approaches for advice and assistance and stands ready to support states and all other stakeholders, including civil society organizations and affected communities in promoting and protecting human rights and especially freedom from arbitrary detention while addressing the drug problem. Moreover, we call upon all stakeholders to take an active role in disseminating this study to uphold the common duty to further the effective implementation of the absolute prohibition of arbitrary detention in the context of drug policies. We ask you all, take this study and own it. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for these powerful words. And I think from the perspective of those of us here from civil society, we definitely stand ready um, and willing um, to, to work with you and support you in disseminating these recommendations and, and in, you know, ensuring they will be implemented. So thank you and thank you again so much for being with us and good luck for this afternoon. Um, we'll be there with you. <laughs> so um, moving on to our next panelist, um, I'm delighted to introduce Yati Jonet. Uh, Yati is an advocate for women who use drugs from Malaysia. As a person who uses drugs and lives with hepatitis C and has spent time in prison and detention centers, and as a single mo mother, Yati is a passionate advocate fighting for the right to health of community members through harm reduction approach approaches, motivational interviewing, mentoring, and knowledge sharing. Um, Yati, I'm so glad you could be here with us today. You have the floor. Hello, everyone. Um... First, I just want to say that I'm, I'm overly excited, I think, um, almost cried hearing this because this is, this is it. This is the moment, the thing, the key thing that actually needs to happen uh, for the past five years. And now we are talking about it and I'm having goosebumps here. <laughs> no, um, I'm much looking forward to what's coming um, ahead. So, um, on behalf, I think I can speak on behalf of the people who use drugs committees around the world. We welcome and, and really appreciate the work of the UN Working Group um, on arbitrary detention, uh, the Human Rights Council, civil society, other strategic partners in addressing the violence of human rights in a person who use drugs livelihoods, which personally speaking, have altered the life of, I mean, it has altered the life of people who use drugs around the world. And let alone uh, the beneficiaries, meaning that the families, spouses and all that, it, it's affected in a very harmful way. And I would like to introduce myself. I'm Yati Jonet, I'm from Malaysia, 47 years old living in this world. Where from first year to my 14 years, I was raised by parents. When I'm 15 to my 35 years, that drug makes its appearance in my life. And that's including my time in prison and also in drug detention centers. As of now, I'm from, two th from my age of 36 to 46 years old. I'm able to uh, I'm able to get out from the the war zone, and now just to make a living. Uh, yes, just to make a living like any other human being. Unfortunately, it comes with like a maybe undiagnosed PTSD or unnecessary paranoia. It's because of the past experience that I I have. Um, in the vicious cycles of uh, punitive drug war. And that is about me. And there are thousands, millions of others which were reported by uh, UNODC every year, people who use drugs uh, having experience most similar like me or maybe more severe than me. Talking about that, um, when talking about the detention center. My experience is definitely di different from others, uh, especially from other country. Um, we are all aware that there are many, I mean, thousands of um, government's uh, own rehab center, which is like compulsory rehab center around Asia, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, for example. We have like in Malaysia, we have hundreds of rehabilitation centers, which includes um, the private rehab centers and also the government uh, uh, compulsory detention centers. And here in my country, I can see like around 5,000 uh, were detained in detention centers. And they are all, uh, most of them are repeated 
repeat the uh, drug users who uh, who was sent there, and without we realized that it's it's the vicious cycles uh, of the punitive law that makes them uh, repeating the same uh, the sequels of uh, being in and out from the rehab center and and also the prison, which supposed to cure or to rehab uh, pe people like us who use drugs. I would like to share that um, I think I am, or maybe many others, I lost our life, I mean, we lost our life at the very moment we were forced to, to go to rehab, at the very moment that we were uh, detained by uh, police officers and was taken to to urine testing and without any possessions of substance we were sentenced we were forced to go to rehab you have to stop using um, you are in danger to the society you can create more harm uh, this is our act of love by taking away um, our uh, by taking away from our family, uh, for example, I mean, it's 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 traumatic. Um, I, I cannot explain the the how how severe it is, and uh, it's it's definitely different. My my experience and other colleagues who use drugs um, have experiences like totally different. We. I don't know how, what to say. When you are taken away from your family, you, you, you lost everything. You lost your dignity and being harassed, abused, and being looked down on sidelines, sidekick in many ways. And to be able to speak to you all here on behalf of other drug users or maybe have passed away. I really hope that this, this report with a very strong recommendation will be taken in place in the States in urgent matter. Looking at this new era of COVID-19, there's an, it is very important to make a change. This is like the right time to make a change. I'm talking about that as a person, women, a mother, we face like double the stigma. We face double the harassment than the men who use drugs because oftentimes we lost our we lost our parental rights to the children our children were taken away as if uh, we are not capable of taking care of our kids me myself like Lose, I'm losing the sense of motherhood to my children. How bad is that? So I, I, I'm trying to get that uh, back from what I've missed uh, for the past 20 years that I've been in a war zone. So I think by having this, uh, I mean, talking to you all here, it's a gift like, it's not easy for me to talk about this and living in the very I, I'm living in Malaysia where um, as if you are suspected as a drug user, you are at any time you can be detained by policemen and at any time you can be taken for urine tests and sent sentenced to prison or rehab. So imagine how 
as the drug users, as the women living in this in this environment, just to make a living, just to be like other people, um, to be not to be a good mother, just to be a mother, just to be a, a partner or a good friend, because I believe that not all drug users are criminal. Do I look like criminal to you? So I really, I would like to take this advantage on this event that there are going to be like good changes in future where no more fear for me to speak out about my rights, health rights, and not just towards me, I mean, towards all drug users uh, in my country and in Southeast Asia or globally, where everyone um, in, in, the, in the past, in, in, the, in the previous years, like we were subjected to this agency. We were subjected to be imposed such as condition by many agencies. So how are we going to make a living with that environment? And I, I, just, I just want to live in a very enabling environment where I can work, I can pay taxes, I can cook for my family, I can go for holidays. Is that so hard to ask? And I don't know, I, I've been like uh, here and there. Um, I think that's all about it. Um, you can ask me any question if uh, with re with regard uh, my experience, so I can I can share with you. Uh, I can answer to you accordingly afterwards. Apologize for all my nervousness and anxiousness. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, there's, there's no apology um, needed. Thank you so much for um, sharing and being so brave. And um, you must read the comments um, that um, so many have responded um, to. Um, yeah, how just powerful and honest you have been in the chat. Um, it's, it's, it's really quite overwhelming. So thank you. And really thank you so much for, for being here with us um, today. Um, and I hope we'll have more time um, to come back to you and we will in the Q&A. Um, so thank you again. We're just going to um, give everyone time to recover a little bit. We'll share a short um, film, very short, just a couple of minutes now from the OHCHR um, on um, decriminalization of drug use and actually features uh, Yati again. So I'll just ask my colleagues from IDPC to, to share the film now. My first taste of drug is when I'm 15. I involved with drug problematically for 20 years. I was sentenced to prison for two times for a small possession of heroin during that time and two times to rehab center. And actually, it doesn't stop me from using as I'm currently using. The so-called war on drugs is given by the idea that crack down on people who use drugs or who are involved in the drug trade, the drug uh, problem will go away. 20% of the prison population now uh, in detention for drug-related offences, including for personal use of drugs. People who use drugs do not forfeit their human rights by virtue of their drug use. And that in parallel, we ensure that their other rights are met as well, in particular, the right to the highest attainable standard of health. We are witnessing, in some cases, increasing human rights violation related to the drug control efforts. 
This includes uh, extrajudicial killings. The fear of criminalization, of arrest, and of punishment acts as a huge structural barrier that um, drives people away from seeking um, health and harm reduction services, um, such as HIV prevent prevention services, needle and syringe programs, for example, and um, has led to an epidemic of HIV amongst people who inject drugs globally. With the criminal record at home as a prisoner for a small possession of heroin at that time, there's no way that I can do even e-hailing job. I cannot do grab or I cannot, I cannot help others. We are asking state to change to move from the punitive approach. Policy changes could also help the criminal justice system to put, take away the pressure from them for only for this crime. So moving on to our next speaker, um, I'm delighted to introduce Anthony Ojoku. Um, Anthony was appointed as the Executive Secretary and Chief Executive Officer of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria in 2018. And prior to that, um, he worked with the Commission in various capacities over two decades. Um, Anthony, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Anne. Your Excellencies, co-panelists, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to stand on the already established protocol. Let me start by appreciating the International Drug Policy Consortium, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and all the partners and co-sponsors that have organized this crucial event. I also want to commend the Working Group on Arbitrary Detentions for the study on arbitrary detentions relating to drug policies portion to the Human Rights Council Resolution 4222. This study is highly commendable and will help national human rights institutions and other stakeholders in advocacy, sensitization, promotion, protection, and enforcement of human rights of persons detained for drug-related offenses. It is important that I set the legal, social, and economic context upon which my intervention will be based from a legal perspective, the decriminalization of drug use in Nigeria is well entrenched in the laws, the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency Act, the Dangerous Drugs Act, the Indian Hemp Act. And this prescribed punishment of over 15 to 25 years, and therefore they are not minor offenses. It is important to note, however, that the legal regime in Nigeria and in many countries in principle recognize the lawful possession of personal use of certain categories of drugs. From a social standpoint, drug use and the related human rights violations, including arbitrary detentions, are driven by vulnerabilities, inequalities, and poverty. Over social conditions, such as lack of access to adequate healthcare, education, and homelessness, are also key contributors in, this, in the same vein, economic conditions such as unemployment, increased vulnerabilities, which in turn deprive individuals of income, dignity, and voice to demand and defend their rights. Looking at the human rights perspective to drug policies and arbitrary arrests, the Constitution of Nigeria in Chapter 4 provides the rights of every person, including those arrested on suspicion of drug-related offenses. These include the rights to life, personal liberty, fair hearing, and dignity of the human person. We have just heard from Yeti how the dignity was affected because of her experiences. These constitutional provisions are to ensure that suspects are not subjected to torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment and extrajudicial execution. The constitution guards against prolonged detention and guarantees expeditious and fair trial for suspects. As national human rights institutions, we have seen constant violation of this relation to drug enforcement in Nigeria. I'll outline a few instances of and detention. The incidents of arbitrary arrests by drug and law enforcement officials founded on mere suspicion of possession, often violating the right to privacy and dignity. 
Officials also deploy unilateral declaration of certain locations as black points or hotspots. This is usually followed by raids, search of persons, premises, blanket arrests, and confiscation of exhibits. Procedures usually adopted in such arrests offend sections five and six of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act 2015, which prohibits undue restraint except in cases of violence or by a court order, as well as not informing the arrested persons of the alleged offenses and their rights. Apart from the legality of such acts, it is a violation of the right to dignity of a human person and constitutes cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. It also impacts negatively on the presumption of innocence, which is the cornerstone of our criminal justice system. Looking at access to justice, prolonged detention, lengthy trials, and access to legal representation and fair trial. Four major outcomes that impact negatively on the right of individuals who face arbitrary arrest and detention. The first is prolonged pretrial detention. This is usually occasioned by the fact that suspects do not have means to secure bail and the inability of drug enforcement agencies to bring them to trial early for want of evidence. Apart from the costs, the second issue is the issue of access to legal representation. Apart from the costs associated with this, there are social cost, cultural stigma attached to suspects arrested for drug use. The third, time, the third is the time it takes to secure justice. It's usually said that justice delayed is justice denied. Section 36.4 of the Nigerian Constitution provides for fair trial within a reasonable time. Lastly, possession of innocence guaranteed by the Constitution is impaired in circumstances of possession of drugs. Looking at institutional perspective, there are weak reformative and rehabilitative procedures. According to the National Drug Law Drug Master Plan of 2015 to 2019, the treatment of drug dependent persons in Nigeria takes place mainly in psychiatric hospitals. There, however, a rise in every rehabilitation institutions run by non-state actors and traditional healers that offer services for addressing cases of juvenile drug use, mental health concerns, and drug addictions. These private institutions have been found to violate human rights of their patients and inmates to liberty, dignity, and freedom from torture, inhuman and degrading treatment. The NHRC has had to inspect some of these premises in 2019 and 2020, and of course, um, requested for the prosecution of the proprietors of these institutions, and is now enforcing that minimum standards of human rights must be kept to operate such centers. There's also institutional corruption, which is a major factor that drives arrests. Now, my recommendations. Your Excellencies, in the light of the foregoing, I want to make the following recommendations. Now, we need to address the vulnerabilities. As I mentioned, illicit, illicit drug use is driven by certain social and economic vulnerabilities. We have to decriminalization of some drug offenses. Decriminalizing drug possession and personal use will go a long way in reducing arbitrary arrests, detention, and associated human rights violations. It will also lead to the congestion of correctional centers and other detention facilities, reducing running costs and exposure to COVID-19 and other health challenges. Institutionalization of non-custodial measures. The legislature, the judiciary, and stakeholders in criminal justice system should strengthen the use of non-custodial measures regarding drug users. Prerogatives of mercy. Executive authorities should conduct review of sentences, exercise their prerogative mercy towards persons already for drug use. Because of this, associated with drug use, most persons associated with drug offenses are not likely to obtain prerogative of mercy. Training of drug enforcement agencies, personnel and officers of drug, in law, drug enforcement agencies, such as the Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency, should be trained on international, regional, and national human rights standards, especially regarding arrest and detention. There should be change of judicial attitude, and there should be reforms in rehabilitation and treatment. Integration of rehabilitation services into the formal healthcare sector will provide more funding and standards. State authorities should also ensure effective licensing and regulation of private treatment. Lastly, Your Excellencies, what should we, what should be the role of national human rights institutions? The national human rights institutions should collaborate with the, with the committee, with the working group, to make sure that um, this report, this study is a, uh, uh, is partnered with the GANRI, which is a global alliance for the network of national human rights institutions, so that national human rights institutions provide 
can increase oversight functions on drug enforcement agencies through monitoring and visiting of detention and holding facilities. Gary can help national, uh, can, can use the, the network of national human rights institutions to adapt recommendations of the working group on arbitrary detention into normative frameworks and principles, including guidelines and advices to drug enforcement agencies and the judiciary. Through Ganri, there should be increased collaboration with civil society organizations and other support groups on drug users to create awareness of human rights standards and other legal protections. And of course, a uh, network of national human rights institutions can enhance free legal and pro bono services to suspects on detention and trial. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Thank you for the moderator for the opportunity to make my intervention. Thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you for your you know, um, real clarity in closing in terms of the role of national human rights institutions in um, taking forward and embedding and operationalizing, operationalizing the important recommendations um, in, in this report. Um, thank you so much. So uh, we'll move on now to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is um, Ambika Satkunanathan. Um, Ambika is a human rights lawyer and advocate based in Sri Lanka. Her work has fo focused on research, advocacy and assisting communities, particularly in the North and the East, in accessing remedies for rights violations. Ambika is currently an Open Society Fellow, um, but from October 2015 to March 2020, she was a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka, where she led the first ever study of prisons. Um, Ambika, thank you for being with us today. You have the floor. Thank you, Anne. Thanks a lot. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this important conversation. Uh, but uh, um, my special thanks are to the working group for what is an excellent and uh, strong report. And I think will be a very useful resource to all of us in the coming years. I will focus on trends and patterns in Southeast Asia based on a recent study I did and also on Sri Lanka. My aim is to show that despite certain differences, there are commonalities in the trends and patterns across regions. This is due to common structural and systemic factors that remain unaddressed and result in these repeated violations, which is why it is critical that we implement the recommendations of the working group. We should view these violations not only from a rule of law perspective, but also use a socioeconomic and political lens to understand the critical need to address the impact of drug policies uh, and the criminalization of uh, vulnerable populations. The rise of populist authoritarian leaders and increased militarization creates a conducive environment to demonize marginalized populations, such as people who use drugs. Now, if we take Southeast Asia, countries in this region, which have some of the harshest drug laws in the country, have generally adopted a punitive rather than a human rights-based public health approach to drug use. As a result, they have in invested considerable resources in incarceration and abstinence-based treatments and compulsory centers for drug users. Many countries in the region present compulsory drug rehabilitation as an alternative to punishment. The laws label drug users as drug dependents or drug addicts, and governments claim that they will be treated as patients. But in practice, what this translates into is compulsory rehabilitation. Data shows that in seven countries in the region, there are close to half a million people sent to re compulsory rehabilitation centers every year with no evidence that shows any clear positive treatment outcomes. The centers are run often by security agencies who have little or no knowledge or expertise to provide clinical treatment for drug dependence and have no capacity to assess treatment needs. People are sent to these uh, centers through laws that mandate arrest and detention and forced urine tests. Uh, through which drug dependence, as we know, cannot be determined. The centers are often overcrowded, conditions are inhumane, and physical abuse is routine. Uh, and there is a lack of robust judicial oversight. Detainees can be subject to welcome, what are called welcome beatings, perpetrators by the room, perpetrated by the room leaders, and allegations of sexual violence are also reported. 
Treatment and rehabilitation comprises of forced withdrawal, abstinence, military style drills and exercises and physical abuse as well as forced labor. This is based on an ideology that drug use can be stopped using one's will and that a person must be punished for using drugs. There is also a lack of access to healthcare or where it is available, it is not of an acceptable level. So now we move to Sri Lanka. So here, you, this is where you see that the parallels, the commonalities. Um, in Sri Lanka, the role of the military in drug control has increased rapidly during the last decade, especially after the conclusion of the armed conflict is in 2009. Uh, the security forces uh, involvement ranges from drug related arrests to conducting awareness programs in schools about drug use. Now, what's important to us are the ways in which the law enables the arbitrary detention of persons arrested for drug offenses. So there are five ways. One is, of course, what we call the infamous Section 54 of the Poisonous uh, Poisons, Opium and Dangerous Drugs Ordinance. Under this law, it is not uh, uh, possible to obtain bail at the magistrate's court, which is the court of the lowest level. Uh, bail is granted only in high court and only in exceptional circumstances. Now, the persons that we interviewed when we did the national study of prisons when I was at the commission, they accused the police of planting drugs to increase the amount of drugs found in their possession because this would result in them being charged under Section 54A, which would in turn prevent them from obtaining bail. Um, as uh, these persons language in pretrial detention, sometimes for months, a year, or even longer, because many cannot afford lawyers, and even if they can, bail is not granted easily. Number two, when the drugs found is about a certain amount, and this depends on the category of the drug, the person will be remanded, and the drug will be sent to the government analyst department to test the pure quantity of the drug. Due to the lack of human resources, there are long delays in the test results being issued, which once again leads to arbitrary detention of persons. Number three, for narcotics below certain amounts, a fine can be imposed. But if the person is unable to pay the fine, they are liable to be imprisoned for up to six months in lieu of the fine. Although the law allows the court to release the person on a bond or a surety and give time to pay the fine in installments, in practice, this is not done. Number four, we have the Drug Dependent Persons Treatment and Rehabilitation Act, which allows an officer in charge of any police station who receives information from anyone that, and I quote, any person is a habitual user of dangerous drugs and has since become a drug dependent person to take steps to present the person for a medical examination and thereafter to produce the person before a magistrate. Now their arbitrary detention can happen during this process and when produced before the magistrate, the magistrate can order compulsory rehabilitation. The fifth way is the Community-Based Corrections Act which is the only alternative to incarceration that we have in Sri Lanka. However, if persons have a history of drug use or prior offenses, the judge may require the person to undergo mandatory drug treatment. Although the act requires the person to consent to this order, the consent cannot be considered to be free of duress because the alternative to mandatory treatment is a prison sentence. So the person really has no option. Now, recently, the Minister of Public Security stated that, and I quote, the police will move to direct drug abusers to rehabilitation centers where they can be treated and they will not seek to prosecute them in court. Now, what this indicates is that the government might make extensive use of the arbitrary power in the Drug Dependent Persons Act or formulate other means to send persons to compulsory rehabilitation. There are two of these uh, centers that are of particular importance, I think, to us when we speak of arbitrary detention. They are within the purview of the Bureau of Commissioner General for Rehabilitation, uh, but they are administered by the military. Now, I will quote a newspaper article that describes these centers. It states that the facilities are kept secure using a double fence around the perimeter with multiple entry points so that there is no possibility for anyone to escape. 
According to the military personnel administering the center who were quoted in this article, persons are required to follow military rules. The article also highlights that the military background of the officers helps them instill discipline in the lives of the rehabilitees. So I think this is where what Anthony said about uh, national human rights institutions also becomes very important because they play a critical role in monitoring, inquiring into violations and in advising government on this. Regrettably, in Sri Lanka, the appointment process of the commission uh, was changed with the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, and it now is in violation of the Paris Principles. So all these issues that I have raised illustrate the, that the implementation of the recommendations of the working group set out in this very important, excellent report, uh, that, that the implementation is imperative. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambika, um, for this. And um, happily, we're slightly ahead of time, so there'll be more time for you all to, to come back and, and say more in the, in the Q&A. Just a reminder to um, anyone to keep putting your questions into the Q&A function and we'll refer these um, where we can to the panelists. Some are being answered in, in written form there. So um, finally over to our last speaker. Um, so Claudia Cardana is a psychologist for Corporation Humanas in Colombia. She's an expert on the promotion and defense of the human rights of women who are currently in prison or have been incarcerated in the past. As a formerly incarcerated woman, Claudia is also the founder and the director of Mujeres Libres, which promotes the abolition of prison for women. Claudia will be speaking in Spanish. So if you have not um, switched on your interpretation to English um, and you need to do so, um, you might want to do that now. Um, Claudia, welcome. You have the floor. Buenos días y buenas tardes, señor. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, agradezco a todos los organizadores por invitarme a ser parte de este panel. Es emocionante, pues nunca imaginé poder llegar a estos espacios tan importantes después de haber estado en prisión. Antes de empezar, debo, debo, quiero manifestar que el nuevo informe del Grupo de Trabajo sobre Detención Arbitraria es un documento muy importante, puesto que reconoce el impacto desproporcionado de las leyes de drogas sobre las mujeres, especialmente aquellas que se encuentran en situaciones de vulnerabilidad. Además, brinda una serie de recomendaciones urgentes como la revisión de las leyes para asegurar que las penas por delitos de drogas sean eh, proporcionadas y que tengan en cuenta las circunstancias particulares de, las personas, de todas las personas involucradas. Por lo tanto, animo a todos los países a trabajar en la implementación de las recomendaciones del informe. En Colombia, al igual que varios países de, de esta región, la principal razón por la cual las mujeres en prisión es, eh, están en prisión es por su participación en delitos relacionados con el tráfico de drogas. Según el informe del Instituto Nacional Penitenciario y Carcelario, INPEC, que es la entidad encargada de las cárceles en Colombia, para finales de mayo de 2021, en Colombia habían 6.864 mujeres privadas de la libertad, de las cuales el 43% se encuentra por delitos de tráfico, fabricación o porte de estupefacientes, casi la mitad de las mujeres en prisión. Y de ellas, el 26,8% se encuentran eh, privadas de la libertad sin que se les haya emitido una sentencia condenatoria en su contra. Esta cantidad de mujeres en prisión no es más que el resultado de la fallida guerra contra las drogas, que a través del sistema punitivo afecta en mayor medida a las mujeres pobres, que ven en este espacio una forma de trabajo ante la falta de oportunidades y las necesidades de sostener a sus a sus, a sus familias, claramente resultado de la desigualdad de género que existe en el país y en muchos lados. 
por experiencia propia y de acompañamiento a mujeres privadas de la libertad y a aquellas que han salido de prisión, sabemos que el panorama dentro de las cárceles no es nada de alentador. En Colombia, la Corte Constitucional ha declarado en tres oportunidades el estado de cosas inconstitucional en el sistema penitenciario y carcelario. También ha emitido órdenes a autoridades responsables para corregir la situación, pero nada ha cambiado. Mis compañeras, mis amigas que aún se encuentran en prisión, viven en condiciones indignas a causa del hacinamiento, la falta de suministro de agua, la mala alimentación, las falencias en la prestación de los servicios de salud y en particular la salud sexual y reproductiva. Estas condiciones ayudaron para que el contagio por COVID-19 fuera acelerado y masivo al interior de las prisiones y hubieran muertes de mujeres que no fueron atendidas. Esto, por lo mismo, ha, ha representado un grave riesgo para la salud, la integridad y la vida de ellas. Desde el inicio de la pandemia, el Ministerio de Justicia y del Derecho y el INPEC crearon medidas de prevención de contagio y atención de la pandemia, pero no lograron el resultado esperado. Lo que sí se logró fue que se profundizara la problemática y se generaran nuevos escenarios de vulneración de derechos a las mujeres privadas de la libertad. En primer lugar, una de las medidas tomadas por el gobierno fue la prohibición del ingreso de personal externo a, a las cárceles. Esto tuvo cuatro efectos concretos. Los defensores no han podido ingresar a las cárceles, limitando esto el acceso al derecho a la defensa y el acceso a la justicia. También se prohibió la visita de familiares, que si bien pues era una forma de prevenir, lo que ha generado es un impacto en el bienestar emocional y psicológico que, porque ellas llevan más de un año sin ver a sus familias y el Estado no adoptó medidas de contingencia. Tampoco se permite el ingreso de personal externo de salud, por tanto se ha afectado directamente la salud sexual y reproductiva. Ellas llevan más de un año sin ser atendidas. Asimismo, los, los profesionales de psiquiatría no han podido ingresar y el servicio de psicología se suspendió. La prohibición del ingreso también se aplica a colaboradores externos como organizaciones de derechos humanos, por lo cual en el último año no se ha podido realizar seguimiento de monitoreo a las condiciones al interior de los establecimientos de reclusión de manera presencial. En segundo lugar, al inicio de la pandemia fue prohibido el ingreso de artículos de primera necesidad, como por ejemplo los productos para la salud menstrual. Y aunque esto no aparece en ningún lineamiento establecido por ley para la atención de la pandemia, las mujeres lo denunciaron. Y an antes de, de que llegara la pandemia, las mujeres ya carecían de estos elementos, pues las autoridades carcelarias y penitenciarias no los pro proveen y esto alenta en la reventa de toallas higiénicas por parte de algunas mujeres y el cobro indebido de dinero por parte de la guardia para poder eh, facilitarlas. En tercer lugar, quiero decir que la pandemia es una oportunidad perdida para avanzar en las medidas alternativas a la prisión. En abril del 2020, el gobierno nacional emitió el decreto legislativo 546 para enfrentar el hacinamiento y prevenir el contagio, sustituyendo la pena de prisión y la medida de aseguramiento en establecimientos penitenciarios y carcelarios por la prisión domiciliaria o la detención domiciliaria transitoria. Entre la población que se beneficiaría en estas medidas estaban mujeres embarazadas, personas discapacitadas, enfermas y mayores de 60 años. Todas las mujeres que se comunicaban con nosotros estaban a la expectativa, creían que iban a volver a ver a sus hijos y a sus hijas, pero lamentablemente se, se excluyó a las personas condenadas o procesadas por más, de, eh, por más de 100 tipos penales, entre ellos todos los delitos relacionados con drogas y otros delitos no violentos. Para diciembre del 2020 y luego de ocho meses de haber sido expedido el decreto, el gobierno reportó la salida de únicamente 815 personas a nivel nacional, entre ellas 
solo 45 mujeres. Los instrumentos internacionales como las reglas Bangkok, como, eh, así como la alerta de la Comisión Interamericana del Consejo de Derechos Humanos y los relatores han sido ignorados por el Estado colombiano. Las órdenes emitidas por la Corte Constitucional no han logrado corregir las violaciones de derechos humanos contra la población privada de la libertad. Se necesita cuestionar con más fuerza esta situación. Se necesita encontrar la ruta para pasar de la acumulación de denuncias a cambios reales y a exigir la materialización del enfoque de género en acciones de las autoridades responsables de las personas privadas de la libertad. Muchísimas gracias por permitirme participar en este evento. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Claudia. Um, and once again, yeah, we have many comments also in the chat, but really thank you for, um, yeah, being brave and also sharing your, your personal experience. And thank you for all the important advocacy um, that you're doing around um, women um, who are in prison for drug offenses. Um, yeah, those of us who follow this issue closely, we know that there's a huge disproportionate um, impact Um, in terms of the burden of these repressive responses on women all over the world. Um, so yeah, very, very grateful you could be here with us as well. Um, so now we will um, also hear um, some interventions just briefly from also co-sponsors um, to this event. And I believe my IDPC colleagues will um, bring the first one in. So this will be Zavid Mahmoud, who's the Drug Policy Advisor at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And I'm hoping he's going to be joining us very shortly. Hello. Hi, Zavid, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm where I will not open the video because connection problem. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the all uh, panelists for their excellent presentation and also overall, Thanks to the Working Group for Arbitrary Detention for their excellent report. From the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, we fully support the report. And we think that this will be an excellent tool for us to work on the ground with the colleagues in different parts of the world. While a Working Group on Arbitrary Detention will, uh, even Uh, system uh, adopted a new common position on incarceration. I think a lot of recommendations which has been incorporated in the working group report, we will also see in the UN system common position on incarceration. I would also like to request the panelists and also other participants to look that uh, particular uh, document. I also take note that uh, our colleague from Nigeria mentioned about Global Alliance and Nation National Human Rights Institution. I think it will be really excellent idea to cooperate with them and bring this report and also other tool which is related to human rights and drug policy. In this regard, I would like to refer the international guidelines on human rights and drug policy, which also mentioned Uh, in the guide in the working group report. I don't want to take too much time then I know that uh, we have very limited time. Again, I would like to congratulate the working group and looking forward to on behalf of the office to work with the working group for the implementation and dissemination also and implementation of the working group's report recommendation. Um, thanks, uh, Anne. And thanks also other co-sponsor for their cooperation on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Zavet. And um, our next co-sponsor, who we will um, briefly hear from, will be Luciana Paul um, from Cells. And I believe she'll join us in just a minute, a second. Oh, sorry, Luciana, please could you raise your hand? Um, that, yes, okay, great. I think we see you. You're still on mute. 
Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, and and I would like to greet the co-organizers of this event. Cells, my organization, is proud to continue working with you on this topic. It's been six years now from the first resolution your delegations contributed to approve. Um, I want to recognize the work done by the working group on arbitrary detention with this report. Uh, the expositions today have has been eloquent, showing its value and its contribution that, that brings in the work we have ahead. Uh, from Argentina and Latin America, we will be most willing to work with you in the dissemination of this report in a region. Uh, I would like to express a special thanks to Yati. Your words touch us all. Your story is the story of so many others who suffered the impact of drug policies in their life and in their bodies and your brave decision to share that with us here at the UN is so powerful and show us that acting against these injustices is imperative. And also, of course, thank you to Claudia, whom we, we have worked together so for a long time also. I would like to raise very briefly the attention on very uh, relevant sections of the report and maybe ask the panelists for your opinion. Uh, that is a section four that focuses in the impact of the arbitrary attention on minorities and relegated groups of the society. Especially, I would like to refer briefly to two. One is the Afro-descendants. You know, not surprisingly, the report of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights in Structural Racism that was launched this week, also identified the drug laws as one of the legal frameworks that perpetuates the structural racism. So I would like to, to ask the panels how you see the, the coordination and the dialogue between, between these two agendas in the, at the Council. And also, of course, of uh, the impact of women. I think the testimony of Yati and of Claudia has been very eloquent on the differential and increased uh, impact on women. So how we can work with uh, also the mechanism that protects the, the uh, rights of women to improve uh, or, or to counteract these violations to their rights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luciana. And finally, before we um, hopefully turn to some questions. Um, we would like to bring in um, Giada Girelli from um, Harm Reduction International, um, another co-sponsor of this event. Um, Giada, maybe you also need to raise your hand to be brought in. Hi, everyone, and thank you for giving me the floor. I'll be, I'll be very brief. Uh, on behalf of Arm Reduction International, I wish to thank the working group for such a thoughtful and valuable report and all the delegations who could sponsor this timely side event, as well as civil society organizations and OHCHR, whose ongoing support we value and appreciate. And in particular, again, Yati and, and Claudia, thanks for your bravery and for keeping us uh, focused on the objective. Uh, we particularly wish to thank the working group for calling on states to protect and promote the role of civil society organizations, including community and peer-led organizations, in the development, implementation, and monitoring of drug policies. And we hope this recommendation will lead to heightened involvement of people who use drugs and other affected communities in the assessment and development of drug policies. Uh, the working group report has also shown the negative impacts of punitive drug policies on both individual and public health by driving people to the margins and preventing them from seeking help when needed. I think we heard about it uh, at land during the side, the side event uh, by imposing ineffective and built out forms of treatment and by diverting essential resources away from much needed health services, including arm reduction services. This Human Rights Council is a, a pivotal one for drug control, as both the Working Group Report and the High Commissioner Report on Systemic Racism that will be discussed on the 12th of, on, uh, the 12th of July have un undeniably demonstrated once again how punitive drug control policies enable a wide range of human rights violations and abuses, providing a dangerous tool to further discriminate against and marginalize already vulnerable communities rather than supporting and empowering them in the way they deserve to be. We sincerely hope this opportunity is not lost upon us because we just cannot afford business as usual anymore. We hope this will be the beginning of further honest evidence-based conversations and initiatives 
both at the local and at the international level among various stakeholders, including people who use drugs, civil society, or CHR, but also UNODC, towards the development of drug policies, which really are human rights and, and centered. So thank you again for organizing this meeting and for being here with us, and I look forward to the, to the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Jada. And again, thank you to all our amazing co-sponsors um, for, um, yeah, helping us to make this event happen. So we have just under 10 minutes um, for some Q&A. And um, I see there's quite a few questions um, already been presented. So um, firstly, I'm gonna um, come to you, uh, Yati. Um, and just bearing in mind, there's only 10 minutes. So I do ask you to keep your responses to just over a minute if possible. Um, so the question is, um, first of all, you are noted as a survivor, you're, in, you're incredibly brave. Um, we would like to hear you share your personal recommendations um, or processes that you would change in the Malaysian criminal system um, with regard to um, drug policy. My answer to that is, um, uh, I know I could go like here and there, uh, bear with me. Um, what I want to see in Malaysia is uh, no punitive drug laws that uh, that enable these enforcement bodies to raid people's house at any time as they want and take away us for 14 days or maybe longer and put it in detention center without any uh, clinical treatment that might be needed by uh, from all of all the drug users that has been detained there. To change the law, I I would like to see uh, a civil society organizations representing uh, the community uh, ourselves um, to to reform uh, a new new drug policy where an active participation and inputs from the civil society uh, during the development of a new drug laws will definitely um, have a benefit both parties where they also have their public uh, security issues that they need to take care of. And we as a, as a drug users community will give input about what uh, what actually uh, as a drug users can do uh, to, to avoid to become a criminal so-called, um, you know, um, I can, I can, I would like to call to everyone that um, as a drug users, we ourselves needs to take care of ourselves, know your substances, why you are taking drugs and what are the harms that actually can cause by the drugs if you take in, in a wrong way. By not having that basic knowledge, you are, you are creating um, a, a further harm to yourself and uh, to, to, the, to, to the society. So it is important to know the facts of drugs, the do's and don'ts of substances, which I, so sad in Malaysia, we don't have that, uh, that uh, community friendly, I mean, the facts about drugs rather than the negative uh, 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 reading materials or, or ads about uh, drugs as we, we've been seen as the number one enemy of the, our country like for 40 years and still. So knowledge sharing where by sharing our experience and how we live without harming anyone, I think uh, will be the best impact for the government to buy, to, to get the, the buy-in from the government. I really hope that this is gonna work. Thanks, Yaki. Thank you so much. Um, yes, there's a lot of hope there um, for Malaysia and many other countries where this is urgently needed. Um, but the next question I'm going to lift up is for Ambika. Um, the question is, um, do you have evidence or indications linking arbitrary arrests in your country to police or military corruption? Um, and 
Yeah, so corruption can be defined as incarceration of consumers or small links while big drug traffickers go unpunished. Um, in other words, security agencies distract the eye. Um, yes, well, uh, in terms of evidence, yes, recently last year, there were a number of uh, police officers from the Police Narcotics Bureau who were arrested because they were involved in the drug trade. Uh, and during the Human Rights Commission uh, study, we actually encountered many people who uh, said that the police planted drugs on them. Um, and just quickly before, I mean, I close, I would just like to make a point, if I may, um, Anne, which is about also um, the UN's role in this, because I think particularly at the country level, the UN role, UN's role is very important as to what kind of programs of the state they support and whether they keep human rights front and center. The UN Secretary General has a rights up front program uh, where you are supposed to ensure that or prevent violations from taking place. So in terms of UN agencies supporting things like, you know, compulsory rehabilitation, etc. So I think that point really does need to be stressed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambika. And finally, um, because of time, I think we'll just ask the last um, question to um, Claudia. And uh, the question is uh, essentially um, twofold, basically. So um, it's firstly, um, we wanted to ask like how um, a woman with, how can women with lived experience um, of incarceration contribute to the reform of disproportionate and punitive drug laws? And also um, a sort of related point is that, you know, we've, it's 10 years since we had the Bangkok rules. Um, and, you know, how can we make governments accountable to these very basic um, standards that we have at the UN? And that's also relevant to, you know, the recommendations of this report, for example. Um, so over to you, um, Claudia. Bueno, gracias. Um, pues para contestar estas dos preguntas, quiero primero contar eh, una experiencia y pues desde la experiencia que he tenido en la cárcel, señalo el desconocimiento general, generalizado de los derechos humanos ni las autoridades estatales, ni los funcionarios de los establecimientos de reclusión y mucho menos las mujeres privadas de la libertad han interiorizado su existencia y, y mucho menos los ven como una realidad. No conocen, por ejemplo, las reglas Bangkok. Y es por esto que eh, varias mujeres en Colombia mmm, que hemos salido de la cárcel tuvimos la oportunidad de conocerlas después y comprendimos hasta qué punto fueron vulnerados nuestros derechos. Por eso decidimos unirnos para trabajar por los derechos de nuestras amigas, compañeras, incluso familiares. Y hoy existe eh, la Corporación Mujeres Libres en Colombia, una organización de mujeres que sufren la prisión por haber estado en ella o tener familiares allí, que busca eliminar este sufrimiento para todas las mujeres y sus familias, fomentando la abolición de la prisión para las mujeres eh, y los efectos negativos que, 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 que produce la cárcel. Desde la iniciativa de Colombia, ahora hay mujeres libres en Chile, El Salvador y México, próximamente eh, en Bolivia y Argentina. Pero además de esto, eh, se han creado otras organizaciones en diferentes países de mujeres que salieron de prisión como por ejemplo Mujeres Unidas por la Libertad, que en este momento nos están escuchando. Y con todas ellas conformamos la Red Latinoamericana de Mujeres Libertarias Fundiendo Rejas. Para contestar un poco más la pregunta, o sea, ¿qué podemos hacer nosotras? Nosotras estamos reuniéndonos para alzar la voz y que nos escuchen. O sea, la experiencia de las mujeres que estuvimos en prisión es importante ser escuchada no solamente desde las organizaciones de derechos humanos ni de la academia, sino la experiencia. Nosotros vivimos en carne propia toda esta situación y creemos que toda, experiencia, toda esta experiencia debe tenerse en cuenta, no solamente para investigaciones y plasmar 
sino eh, podemos ser parte en nuestros países para generar esas políticas públicas y la política criminal incluso con enfoque de género. Y, ¿Cómo animar a estos países? Pues nosotros también me hacían otra pregunta de si, si hemos sido escuchadas por parte del gobierno colombiano. Claro, eh, también la idea de nosotras mismas, alzar la voz por nosotras mismas y por nuestras compañeras, ha generado como un impacto y eh, pues los estados nos han ido escuchando. Lo, lo, lo terrible, lo malo, es que pueden que nos, nos, nos inviten a estas reuniones, pero siempre los gobiernos son cerrados y, y al final... Eh, las observaciones que hacemos no son tenidas en cuenta, Entonces, pero seguiremos trabajando y seguiremos unidas con todas estas compañeras de Latinoamérica, incluso con otros países eh, fuera de Latinoamérica, para seguir eh, en la lucha contra la criminalidad, de la, eh, la criminalización de las mujeres. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Claudia, for your very clear and strong answer there. And of course, yeah, um, communities need to be front and center and at every table where decisions are um, being made about them and their lives. So thank you for this answer. Um, we're very lucky to have just been joined um, by Lee Toomey. Lee um, is the former uh, chair of the working group um, on arbitrary detention and really presided over um, this amazing report that we've been discussing today. Um, Lee, I'm basically going to give you the final word, but I wanted to just kind of integrate a question into that, if that's okay, to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, and it's a question that I'm uh, formulating from a colleague who's put one into the chat about, you know, the sort of overwhelming punitive um, criminalization um, that we see basically underpinned by the UN Drug Control Conventions. And that seems to be the dominant um, normative um, and legal framework that governments adhere to in their drug control um, policies and laws and implementation. So how can or how do you see human rights um, standards and this, you know, increasing human rights oversight, I would say, from the um, UN drug control regime, being able to disrupt um, this like long standing um, sort of, yeah, psychology of, of punishment when it comes to drugs. Um, so, yeah, over to you. Thank you. And can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great, thank you for your kind remarks. It, uh, it was wonderful to work with all of you in developing uh, the final report. Um, just briefly, I, I know time is short. My name is Lee Toomey and I'm a, a member of the working group. Um, I wanted to thank the uh, co-sponsors and those speaking tonight. It truly has been a wonderful event and thank you so much for your work in promoting our report. We look forward to working with all of you um, in its, its further dissemination and implementation. To answer your question, Anne, and uh, I've been here the luckily luckily to be here uh, for the full hour and a half, so I've been listening to all the wonderful presentations. Um, it's an important question, and um, if there's anything that people take away from our report, it would be that we see the human rights normative framework as really pointing in the direction of drug use as being a health um, problem. That it's one that should be treated in the community with voluntary services and not, as you mentioned, a punitive problem. And incarceration should really be the last resort. Now, in the UN, we're lucky enough to have a number of mandates that can also support the um, working group on arbitrary detention, including torture, health, etc. So I think that working with them in really refining the message, perhaps through favourable media sources, as we recommend as well, can really help to get that messaging across that to move the, the dialogue and the narrative away from punitive to more of a health intervention, I think we'll, we will go a very long way um, in addressing the mass incarceration that you mentioned. And I think also as IDPC and others have done an excellent job in pointing out um, that the um, alternatives to incarceration need to be seen in the broader social network in which people live. Um, and a number of speakers talked about that today. And that is including women, um, but that is that we need to look at other measures such as social networks, education, 
um, employment opportunities and other forms of support uh, as part of alternatives um, to incarceration. And I think that's a really important point that we would like everyone to take away. It's, it's more of a holistic looking at um, drug use and uh, possession is a uh, health problem, but also a broader way um, of looking at things and, and also at diversion points too in the criminal justice system, really trying to keep people out of the system and, and seeing their problems and their background, what criminal history they may have had, what led to them um, to this point is, is going to be a really big um, issue in reducing um, the level of incarceration going forward. I know time is up, but uh, thank you very much once again for this evening and uh, thank you for your kind comments on our report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee, and really so great that you could join us right at the end. We're totally out of time, but it's been um, such a rich and great conversation that we've had today. I still sense so much um, yeah, demand and hunger to continue this discussion, and I think we absolutely need to do so. Um, it's been so powerful to hear from all of the panelists, um, the perspectives from um, the experiences at the national level, but also the lived experiences, um, the powerful testimony that Yati and, and Claudia have have brought to the discussion today and really um, you know, remind us how urgent we need to move away from repressive and punitive drug control that has really destroyed the lives of so many all over the world. And that's why this report um, is critical, um, just to really um, echo um, the, the chair's remarks in her opening that, you know, all of us as stakeholders need to own this report now to disseminate it, to work towards its implementation, to hold member states accountable to encourage those friendly member states to provide resources for the implementation um, of these recommendations. Um, and yeah, I, I just also wanted to let you know that we plan to have a summary report of the discussion that we've had here today. Of course, there will be a recording um, which we will share widely. And finally, to um, say to Lee, you know, good luck for the um, interactive dialogue, which starts right now at the council. So, you know, the conversation certainly doesn't end here. Thank you so much to wonderful panelists and to our co-sponsors for being with us today. Um, really appreciate your time. Thank you.